Good morning. Thank you so much, Ashley, for taking the time to meet with me today for this interview. My name is Annalise Fussell. I'm from Everglades Foundation. I am their K through 12 education and outreach assistant. So the Everglades Foundation is an environmental nonprofit. We're located here in Miami-Dade County, and we do have employees statewide. We were established in 1993. Our mission is to protect and restore the Everglades. We work towards this Everglades restoration in many different avenues, including science, advocacy, policy, and education. And of course, working in the education department, I am working with K through 12 schools throughout the entire state of Florida. And we provide a free K through 12 standards aligned Everglades curriculum. So that's a little bit about us, and I would love to learn a little bit more about you. So if you don't mind telling us a little bit about yourself and the program that you work with, that would be fantastic. Hi, everyone. I want to say thank you to Annalise and the Everglades Foundation for reaching out. I am thrilled to be here um, and hopefully shed some light on our state animal. Uh, so my name is Ashley O'Connor, and I am the Panther Outreach Specialist for our state wildlife agency, which is the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, and for short, we call it FWC. So my job is focused on education and outreach to the public about the Florida Panther. Fantastic. And how did the FWC Florida Panther program begin? Like when, how, why, what's, what's the whole backstory? So in the late 70s and early 80s, um, many um, organizations and, and, and agencies had realized that the population of Puma concolor, the, the panther that inhabits the southeast, had significantly decreased. Um, in the late 70s, the World Wildlife Federation um, had decided to fund a man named Roy McBride to come down to South Florida to see if he could find any sign of panthers because it was thought that they might even be um, extinct. So he did find um, a sign of the animals living still in South Florida and that information prompted our agency at the time, which is the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission, um, to create a team to focus on this species, to collect data, learn about them, and see if it was possible to help them recover from um, being such a small population. Wow, fantastic. We're so lucky to have organizations such as yours. Um, so what exactly are your job duties working as the Panther Outreach Specialist for FWC? So my job focuses on outreach and education. I um, hope to connect with um, local communities and residents in Florida to help them learn about the biology and ecology of this animal. And I think that's um, supremely important because when you can learn about an animal, especially a large carnivore, um, a large predator, I think um, understanding them can help wipe away any fear that might be there um, because of misinformation. And um, the education that you learn in the process um, gives you power. And by power, I mean um, the power to make mindful, educated decisions about um, your views of um, conservation, of predators, and, and um, helping in your local community. And Ashley, why is the Florida panther important to the Everglades and to us? When we restore and protect land, um, we allow nature to function as it should. So protecting vast expanses of wildland allows for water recharge of our aquifers. And as humans, we rely so heavily on water. And um, I think many of you are learning that through an organization like the Everglades Foundation. Um, the panther is also considered a keystone species. And by that, I mean they play a special role in the ecosystem. And when you take an animal like the panther out, there are trickle down effects throughout the food web that can in time degrade the ecosystem and lead to loss of other species. There's, uh, they're also um, called ecosystem engineers. So by that I mean when a panther preys on say a white-tailed deer, 
um, it will consume that animal. And then parts that are left will be scavenged upon by other small predators um, or, or other scavengers. And so they will benefit from the panther's um, predative activities. And then that, that carcass that is left will have tons of bacteria and insects and all kinds of cool little critters in it that are helping to decompose what's left. So that in turn goes down into our soil and helps enrich the health of our soil. And then um, in turn in, enriching that small micro habitat um, right there at that kill site. So it's a, a very connected situation with, with all aspects of, of animals and creatures that live in the ecosystem. Yes, I can't agree anymore. Everything is definitely connected. Uh, we have multiple Everglades literacy program uh, lesson plans that talk all about the food chains and the endangered Florida panther and how preserving these species not only, you know, of course, helps them, but also helps us, like you said, our water supply. Um, here in the Everglades, our water supply comes from that fresh rain, and one in three Floridians rely on the Everglades for their drinking water. Um, also, Ashley, how have Florida panther populations changed over time, and what would their biggest drivers be for that decline? Um, so the population has changed over time. Um, pumas once panthers, pumas once ranged throughout the southeast, and um, because of humans, their population has gotten smaller and smaller um, into a, a very secluded and isolated population here in South Florida. And it was thought in the 70s and 80s that their population was only around 20 to 30 individuals. And that small population suffered from something called inbreeding depression. And that means that animals that were too closely related were um, producing offspring. And those offspring were very sick and, and unwell and, and often unable to survive to adulthood to reproduce again. And um, so with that um, knowledge came the choice to introduce pumas or panthers that lived in Texas. And these um, females were going to offer new genetic material to our population that was struggling with a very low diversity of genetic material. So eight puma females from Texas were released. Five of them produced offspring with local males in the area. And then those, um, those five females produced 20 offspring and um, that those, those offspring helped bring our population out of the dire straits of inbreeding depression. And that has led to the increase in the population with the most recent estimation um, in our area from 2015 being 120 to 230 subadults and adults. So they have gone from 20 to 30 in the 70s and 80s to 120 to 230 now in the 2000s. So they really have experienced um, a nice increase over the decades. Yeah. And um, some of the biggest drivers um, for population decline that these cats are experiencing are habitat loss and degradation and fragmentation and also road mortalities um, because of the, the many roads and, and interstates that we have moving throughout Florida. Wow. Uh, well, it's really great to hear that their populations are bouncing back. Um, we hope that that trend continues. So like I said, Everglades Foundation, our mission is to restore and protect our Everglades. And how do you think Everglades restoration will help Florida panther populations in the wild? So as stated in the recovery plan that you all read with this um, lesson, the habitat and ecosystem restoration and repair are vital aspects of the survival of the population as a whole. So um, as habitat is saved and restored, um, it is increased in diverse diversity and that can support uh, a better prey base. Um, and that is one of the vital aspects of the, the panther's life. Along with clean water, like we just spoke about, um, they also need to have food to eat. Fantastic. And how is your program and FWC in general aiding in Florida panther conservation efforts? So our um, panther team at FWC focuses on hands-on research with panthers. 
Um, we focus on collecting data about them and the data that's collected and shared with the help of partner organizations and agencies um, can help us understand the needs of the population, um, their current status, and this can lead to uh, making recommendations and decisions about um, potential land that might need to be conserved in the future, understanding their prey base and um, hunting quotas and, and many other of those trickle down effects that, that we understand um, happens in, in a complex food web. We are so grateful to have organizations such as yours that do that in the field research, hands-on research. We directly use that research and data in our curriculum. So we have many different lesson plans, specifically the fifth grade lesson plan to do with Florida Panther populations. It's called Incredible Shrinking Habitat. And we use all of the data you guys are collecting. So it's, it's really nice to be able to have sound science with our education. Um, also, working as the Panther Outreach Specialist with FWC, what do you consider as real conservation? And I ask you that because we are all aware now there are many documentaries and TV shows, et cetera, out there that are teaching people the wrong things, I would say, about conservation. And we want to set you know, the record straight and get it directly from the horse's mouth. What do you consider real uh, panther conservation? Um, one thing, I think it's always important um, when you're reading the news or seeing um, anything on, on television or documentaries is to learn more about what you've seen, is, is to, um, to keep asking questions. I think that's vitally important to, to really dig deep into um, what you have learned from something. Um, I also think that real conservation is many things. There's no one um, golden ticket or silver bullet that is going to repair um, what humans have done to our local ecosystems and the world at large. Um, so I think conservation needs to be purpose driven. It needs to have goals that have measurable objectives. And I think real conservation requires the input of peers, scientists and organizations and other special interest groups. Um, and I think it's important to come together and um, work together to make sure that we um, are all on the same page about where conservation is going with um, various specific animals. So in our case, you know, large cats. Um, there are accredited genetic programs out there and they do um, have their, their place in the pie. I think of conservation as a pie. There are many slices. And um, with if every different species, um, what's in that pie and, uh, and those different sizes, they, they change. Um, so they certainly do have their role. Um, but we, I think, also want to focus primarily on the wild populations. How can we allow these animals in the wild to um, do what they are meant to do, to, um, to hunt and to reproduce and um, to expand their ranges naturally. I think that's uh, sort of the primary goal. Um, also, you know, but considering that um, accredited genetic um, restoration organizations do have their, their place in the conservation of not just large cats, but other species in general. Absolutely. Thank you so much for letting us know this. So what types of science tools or technologies does your program specifically use to aid in the conservation? Um, so we have lots of fun and, and different ways that we use technology um, that I have learned about and experienced over the years. Um, so one of them might be a radio telemetry. And um, we use this to track how panthers move about the landscape. We utilize the VHF and GPS radio collars. And um, we have different situations where we might choose one over the other. Um, we also utilize airplanes to collect that VHF data. Um, so our, our biologists are flying three times a week to um, take locations on where our collared cats are moving in South Florida. 
Um, so with that, we collect that um, information from their callers about where they are, and then we can use a technology called GIS, Geographic Information Systems. And this um, allows us to visually, on the computer, look at maps and understand how um, panthers are utilizing um, their habitat and, and the ecosystems that they inhabit. We also utilize trail cameras um, to collect data. Um, this has been especially important in recent years um, now that we are trying to identify um, the cats that are affected by this um, hind limb malady and, um, and identifying where uh, animals might be suffering from this, um, this hind limb issue. Um, so it, it is evolving, the, the technologies that we're using and, and why we need to use them. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's fantastic that you guys are able to use all these technologies and get the vital data for so many other sources. Um, how would you say that the public can help Florida Panther conservation in their own way? They don't have all the tools and technologies, but I'm sure they can yeah. do something, right? It, it starts with just one step. Um, I think focusing on um, your home and your community and, and moving forward from there, you can't just save vast tracts of land um, as your first step forward. You know, I think it's um, supporting conservation of vast tracts of land in perpetuity. Um, so this is um, getting involved with your um, local government and, and your legislatures to, to share that you do support um, having these wild spaces that we need, you know, for water and fresh air. Um, purchasing the panther plate helps to fund um, what our biologists are doing here. And as simple things as picking up trash, you know, on the street that you live on, um, you know, there's, there's no um, step that you take that's too small. Um, so I, I think it's important to remember, even if you are a young person in the world, every little thing that you try to do um, for conservation is important. I could not agree more, Ashley. Wow. Thank you so much for all of your thoughtful responses and this vital information. We really do appreciate it. And do you have any advice for students looking into a career some of yours? So I think it's important to not give up. Um, the world is not going to hand you um, a career in this field. Um, it's something you definitely have to work for. I think it's um, important to know that there are many, many different ways that you can contribute to the conservation of our natural resources. Um, so learning all of the things that you can. Um, and we are all blessed with different skill sets. Um, so I think it's, it's great to recognize what you're good at and to hone those. Um, and also to actively seek out learning opportunities. Um, as a, an adult professional, um, you know, um, specialist, I am still seeking out learning opportunities. I also think it's um, really helpful to find a mentor, you know, even if it's a, a science teacher or a scout leader or a local park ranger, um, someone that is involved in, in natural resources. Um, many of us want to help our, um, the generations that are coming up. We want to help you guys succeed and, and help you find your passions. So um, don't be afraid to reach out to, to an adult and um, see how they can help you um, get more involved in conservation. Yes, this is such great advice. Definitely students never stop wanting to learn. That is the key to life, I feel. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you so much, Ashley, for everything. We really do appreciate your time today. And I really do look forward to future collaborations further with you and your organization. And yeah, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure. Awesome. All right. Until next time. Bye. Bye.